Hi, welcome to Jet Radio. I'm Ted Shire, your host, and with me today is John Rothschild. He is the regional president of Bank Iowa, and we're going to talk to John today about uh, community investment. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me, Ted. Yep. Uh, a few introductory remarks, and then we'll uh, let John introduce himself and his work. So Jet Radio is dedicated to community service as a means of sustainability, and the more people are involved in the community, uh, the more sustainable it'll be. And some recent facts for you. Uh, last time we alluded to how about 20% of our GDP is spent on health care, and that is more than uh, any other country, and it's been that way for several years. And recently, uh, companies have been trying to establish workplace wellness programs However, only about 7% of those, according to Walcoa, are uh, results-oriented programs. Most are activity-oriented programs that don't really measure the kind of metrics that are needed to, uh, to produce results. And uh, there are a few parameters that can be uh, specifically measured that will yield the kind of results that we need uh, to improve wellness. Uh, most of our uh, disease in this country is preventable, and that's why we talked about preventive health care uh, last time. And actually, most of our expenditures uh, in terms of social spending uh, are preventable as well. And so today we're going to talk about community investment and how that can play a role in um, reducing some of those expenditures. So, John, uh could you introduce yourself and tell us about your work? Uh, sure. Um, again, my name is John Rathjen, and I currently work for Bank Iowa and serve as their regional president uh, overseeing the Des Moines market for our banking institution. Yeah. And uh, tell us a little about the organizations you've been involved with. Okay. Well, I've been involved in a lot of different uh, economic development groups, nonprofit groups, chamber organizations, um, and uh, just had the good fortune to have worked in a number of different areas, uh, have participated in some initiatives through various city and county governments and those kinds of things. So I've been incredibly blessed to be able to uh, do that. I enjoy doing it and, you know, work with organizations and see how they can truly make a difference uh, in communities and the lives of people in various communities. Yeah. Uh, what about it do you enjoy? Uh, what stands out? Well, for me... Um, I would start by telling you that I really enjoy working with people. Um, I thrive on being around others, and, and I really enjoy participating in uh, a group that really has a, a mission that's well spelled out and clearly has identified a need and is doing its very best to meet a need that exists uh, within a, a certain community. And so that could be a nonprofit organization, again, uh, a city agency, a, a governmental type situation where you're helping with, but just to participate in those situations and then to what extent I've been able to, you know, be able to help. And, uh, and I've done that in a lot of different ways, whether it's serving on the board, helping with campaigns, fundraising efforts, uh, different, different initiatives and so forth. So it's, it's been, um, something I like doing. And it's been very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Do you like the strategy part of that? You know, I do. Um, you know, I think, again, you know, when you talk about strategy, it really boils down to what is the mission, what's the goal, and, you know, really is, you know, that organization meeting its stated objectives and expectations. And, um, again, you know, I think probably where I had my best experience learning how important that was when I served on United Way. And um, at that time, United Way was kind of ran a little bit different than it is today. It had allocation panels where you would evaluate requests from different nonprofit agencies and and try and make a decision who's doing the best job with the money that don't united way has given that particular organization in terms of making a difference yeah explain uh explain that umbrella organization uh type structure to us the united way yeah well the united way operates all over the united states um certainly here you know in des moines it's the central iowa uh, United Way that exists and a um, very strong organization raises a tremendous amount of money for a lot of different organizations. Uh, before I moved here, I lived in Waterloo Cedar Falls. Uh, I was on the Northeast Iowa United Way. And so we, again, did many of the same things that this United Way does here. But if you look at the United Way in Central Iowa, 
I mean, really what they're doing is they're basing, you know, uh, what they're doing really into three key categories. And again, I think they're trying to do some, some needs-based uh, fundraising and put it with agencies can, that can really focus in the area of improving the educational uh, potential of, of students in the state of Iowa. I think there's certainly a component that they're working on that really is focused on, you know, trying to build, um, you know, healthy behavior in terms of, you know, whether it's eating or, you know, fitness, those kinds of things. And then really they have a component that's focused around increasing financial stability uh, within individuals. And so I think most of their efforts today would again be focused in the area of education, healthy living behavior, and increasing financial stability. Mm -hmm. and, and explain those components for us a little bit more. Uh, uh, for instance, the financial s stability, how are they going about that? Well, again, I think what they're trying to do is work on things that, first of all, help people do a better job understanding their financial position. Um, and again, I think all of these kind of play together. I think education and financial stability have a direct link. But again, I think, you know, when you look at the the demographics and the median income and and you know there's a lot of different areas that they put focus into and so I think a lot of it again comes back to the educational component probably the uh, better prepared our workers are uh, for the jobs that exist today mm -hmm. uh, financially you'll be in a better position so again uh, I can't sit here and give you all of their particular initiatives as I sit here, but they really are focused in those three key areas. Okay. Um, you're, you're familiar with the financial end of things, but if a business wanted to invest in some of those priorities, you know, preventive health care uh, through United Way, um, is, uh, what are the advantages to, to doing that, uh, to, uh, to going through United Way? Well, I think the United Way is probably – taken a pretty deep dive in terms of evaluating uh, these organizations and their effectiveness. And so I think would say a couple of things about United Way. I mean, they have the lowest cost structure in terms of raising money uh, for different organizations and various needs. And so the, the cost to raise funds from the, for these organizations is, is very affordable and can be done in many times cheaper than they can do it on their own. But I would say that United Way has vetted these organizations and made sure that their mission and uh, you know their outcomes are meeting the mission of United Way. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, and maybe as you're sitting here as an individual company or individual, maybe you you haven't had that time. So I think there's some comfort that should come when you donate to United Way that th those dollars really are going to incredibly good causes. Yeah. So I, I think the the something that would be of interest is is it sometimes better for a, a business to start its own organization or is it all you know how do you fine tune whether it's better to, to start your own organization or to go through uh, an existing organization okay um so i think what you're saying is if a business is being asked to support an organization is it better off to give it directly to them or give it through united way or are you talking about starting another agency that wants to do some good work in the community that maybe isn't being done at the present time? Yeah, that, that's a good issue to talk about. And I think what I was referring to is if there's a cause that a business has, mm -hmm. and some businesses have the resources to start their own nonprofit, you know, their own organization to address that cause, is it is it better to uh, go ahead and and, and start it themselves or go through an existing organization that may already be addressing that, that cause? Yeah, I would say that uh, most companies have a particular passion for, you know, one type of initiative or another. Uh, one organization might really feel strongly about health care. Another one might feel strongly about economic development. Um, but if there's an initiative that um, they see that would benefit the community, um, I think generally companies would like to work with a nonprofit that maybe is already doing parts of that or would like to talk to the most compatible agency about uh, who could do that and uh, how that particular business or a bank, for instance, might provide the funding and maybe some of the volunteer support to make it happen. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, I think about it as not in reinventing the wheel, mm -hmm. you know, 
I mean, if you don't have to reinvent the wheel, isn't it <clears throat> usually uh, the best thing to just go with someone that already has the expertise? Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, you'll see uh, a lot of different organizations that will partner with nonprofits and, you know, they'll have a, an event or a function and it'll be, you know, labeled with their name and they that particular business feels strongly about it. So they put some significant funding or resources or volunteer efforts behind it to make sure that it's a success. Yeah. So in cases where there are, you know, there, there's a lot of things that can be addressed and, and a lot of novel ways to address community issues. So, so there is room for the type of community investment where, you know, a, a person or a business with resources could, could go ahead and start that new organization. Mm-hmm. So um, what are some uh, things that could facilitate, uh, say they, 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 uh, had a specific cause that, yeah, we want to do this ourselves. What are some things that could facilitate <clears throat> that process of community investment? For them to do it on their own or for yeah, them to do for the fund? Uh, well, again, I think that, um, you know, the one thing that the nonprofits, for instance, have as an advantage is they're that, just that, they're a nonprofit. So it's a more economical way to, to fund and meet a need. Um, I would say that you know, what I see happen a lot is that, you know, businesses that have the right amount of resources will establish a foundation uh, or an endowment that's intended to build a, uh, a funding source for particular initiatives. And so, and if you're wanting to access those funds from the community, there's an application process that you would go through and, and a selection process that would say, okay, this is a worthy cause, and so we will put the funding behind it. So a lot of your larger companies will have foundations, uh, and they put money in there to really uh, drive certain initiatives. That's probably the most uh, recognizable way that larger companies are doing it today. Mm-hmm. What what kind of personnel would they need? You know, to to start up, <clears throat> you know, uh, a foundation branch or. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I would say generally, you know, um, if you have a foundation and you're making your charitable donations out of that foundation, it might be somebody that's already doing other things for your bank. It might be your marketing person. It might be your public relations person. If it's a large company, um, like Principal or John Deere and Company, uh, that has a lot of activity, then it's probably uh, staffed with one or more people to manage that and promote it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, you've, you've been part of 30 organizations, and so I uh, wanted to ask you about a few different types of, of organizations that you've been part of, chambers of, of con- uh, mm-hmm. commerce. How, how can they help uh, facilitate community investment? Well, I think when you look at the chamber of commerce, obviously there's a lot of different things that fall underneath that umbrella, but really it is a quality of life organization. And, um, you know, that really touches a lot of the different areas that we've already talked about. But um, it really is trying to make sure that you've addressed the, the needs of the community, the economic conditions of the community, you know, uh, maybe take some political positions on, you know, uh, how or legislative positions, those kinds of things to line up with, you know, different chamber initiatives and that kind of thing. But uh, it really is an organization that is intended to bring business together, uh, to work together, and, you know, build a consensus behind all these different issues. Yeah, no, that's good. So um, if it's quality of life, then they'd be a a pretty uh, well-suited organization for promoting preventive health care. Is that correct? Absolutely. What, have you seen some of those type of initiatives? Could you describe some of those? You know, I'll be honest. I haven't seen a lot of that come out of the chamber organizations. Uh, they've probably been more focused on the arts and the culture and education and and economic development. Um, and not to suggest that that hasn't, you know, been on their radar. But mm. in my experience with the chamber, it's probably not been a real focal point to take a hard stance on promoting health issues. I think they're always supporting, you know, healthier living, uh, always supporting, you know, recreational opportunities, for instance, which I guess really does go hand in hand with health concerns. 
And so whether it's, uh, you know, making sure that you've got the trails and, you know, all the athletic venues for people to utilize so that they can live a healthier life, uh, the Chamber is generally behind a lot of that. Mm -hmm. would, would Chambers of Commerce be appropriate for uh, promoting workplace wellness, working with businesses for that kind of thing? I, I think every place should be doing that. Mm. And so, um, and it, I think it would be a perfect opportunity for the Chambers to, you know, put a specific focus on that. And so, you know, when you look at the state of Iowa, we have the healthy walk once a year and, you know, all of those kinds of things. And so I think that um, there's always room for the chamber and others to do more of that. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about the healthy walk. Well, it's the governor's initiative that, uh, you know, we become one of the healthiest state, you know, uh, states in the United States. And so it's been held every year for the last number of years. And so um, and I haven't heard the particulars on it this year. I'm assuming it'll be held again this year. But I think there really is a push, you know, from the state and even the federal government to uh, really put more focus on some of the uh, the health concerns that are have been there and continue to develop. Yeah. Are, are you familiar with with some of the specifics of the Healthy State Initiative? I'm not. I mean, I just I'm aware of it and you know know that it is a focus that. We do want to be known as one of the healthiest states in the union. Yeah, yeah. What about school boards? Okay. Uh, tell us about your experience there. Well, I've never served on a school board, but I've certainly served on a lot of school committees and, you know, helped uh, community colleges and local high schools uh, raise and build support for bond issues, property, plant, and equipment levies, those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, and served on a number of oversight boards and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of that is important. And, you know, I think that the state of Iowa has done a pretty good job in general, you know, getting the school facilities closer to where they need to be so students have a quality place to go and learn. And I'm not sure that was the case 20 years ago. So yeah. I think the facilities that we have generally today are, are pretty good. Mm-hmm. What do you think uh, schools can do to promote more, you know, health, nutrition, healthy eating, uh, things like that? Um, well, I think there's a lot of things that that they can do. Uh, some of them they've already they're doing or have done. I think, and again, I just see a lot of this on the news, whether it's putting the right food in the vending machine and taking out the the soda and replacing it with you know healthy drinks, uh, that kind of thing. I think it's really just continuing to make a focus on physical fitness um, and, um, you know, really just doing as much as they can to maybe create some of those extracurricular activities that uh, are important. And then I guess just making sure that people understand, for instance, diabetes and some of the side effects of that at a pretty young age. Yeah. And uh, again, so much of this is, is linked to diet and exercise. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, when you were with uh, Cedar Valley Food Bank, uh, was what was your role uh, there? Well, I served on their board, um, and I again, I when they had a need to build a new facility, the facility that they happened to be at the, in at the time was an older facility, and really uh, the organization had outgrown it, and so it wasn't functional, and so. Uh, there was a feasibility study that was done. The community says, yes, we need a new facility. And so um, when they launched that capital campaign, I agreed to chair that campaign and help them with that fundraising effort. And so, um, you know, today that facility is up and running, and the food bank has done and continues to do tremendous work in helping people with a great need. Yeah. Um, let's talk uh, more about that when we come back from our, our break. But we are with John Rochin today, and he is uh, the original president of Bank Iowa. And we're talking with him today about community investment. And when we return, we'll have some follow-up questions for the Cedar Valley Food Bank and the work that they're doing. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Brian Leach, owner of Service Legends, and my position is Chief Talent Officer. I'm Nicholas Wondershide. I am Bernie Hobbs. And I'm the service manager. Marketing director and client relations manager. Everything that we do 
is about ensuring that we exceed your expectations. Our clients are important to us, 100% satisfaction. We're not just focused on heating and cooling. That's the easiest part of our job, actually, is fixing furnaces and air conditioners. Everyone that we come in touch with, we want to improve lives. Bottom line is, we've got our installation guarantees, 25% energy savings guarantee, comfort guarantee, temperature selection guarantee, property protection guarantee. 100% satisfaction guaranteed, fixed rate or it's free. All of those guarantees are backed up with a 100% money back guarantee to hold ourselves accountable to making sure that you get what you're after. Just fixing the problem today, if they have another problem five days down the road, it's still a fixed rate or it's free. We use what's called straightforward pricing. Our technicians are gonna give you an exact to the penny price on what it's gonna take before they move forward with any repair. That way you know what to expect. It's the same price every day. No surprises. If you get off work at five o'clock in the afternoon, you come home, you realize that, oh, my furnace is broken. Now you need to call somebody out that night. You shouldn't have to pay more for that. We're guaranteeing service 24-7. We run afternoons, evenings, nights, weekends. We're staffed to work that. Phone rings at 3 in the morning. You'll get one of our representatives answering the phone every time. We're not sending you out to Timbuktu in some call center. It's our service legend team members, our mission control team. I'll take a call anytime. And then they answer the phones same way during the day as they do at night. It's a great day at your service company. How can we make you smile? That's the only way to provide true 24-hour service. When you're able to let somebody actually live in their home safely when they weren't able to do that before, where they don't have to stay up at night and worry about is the heat going to come back on? Are we going to freeze the pipes? Is the baby in the room next door going to be sick because they got too cold? When you're able to help somebody overcome challenges like that, that's impacting a life. That makes a difference. I get goosebumps thinking about it. I love the team. I love the people that I work with. <laughs> we have fun, but we work hard. I call them my ambassadors of legendary service. If you could just envision what that is, that's who we're sending to your home. They literally will call in, pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I want to talk to your manager. And I get on the phone, they're like, that technician that was at my house was the greatest technician ever. That's cool to me. We want to brighten people's days. Every person that we have going into the house has gone through an extensive background check. Drug testing, we have a very thorough interview process that one out of 140 people make it through. If we promise you something, that's what you're going to get, no matter what. We're here when you need us to protect the safety and comfort of your family. If you're not happy, we're gonna make it right. If we're willing to put 100% money back guarantee on what we do, what type of work do you think we do? Give us a call. We're there for you 24-7, 365 days a year. Enough said. Hi, welcome back to Jet Radio. I'm Ted Char, your host, and with me today is John Rothchen. He is the regional president of Bank Iowa, and we were talking about the Cedar Valley Food Bank when we left, and we've got some more follow-up questions for you there. John, tell us uh, about the involvement of Cedar Valley Food Bank in the community and, and what they were doing. Uh, to, to make it a better place? Well, again, I think they were, their mission really was to, you know, help provide some healthy meals and nutrition for folks that really had a, a need. Um, and so, you know, if you spend all time working with that particular food bank or any other food bank, I think it would, it's kind of eye-popping the, the number of people that really are struggling for their, that next meal. And so to have a food bank that you know, has recognized that need and is proactively trying to take steps to, you know, get some healthy food and nutrition to those people is really important. So, um, you know, I, I can't say enough good things about the food banks across the country and the work that they do because, uh, you know, without them, uh, folks truly would go hungry. Yeah. Was there, uh, were there other parts of the program there uh, besides food? Did they have some job training, things like that, or...? Not so much a job training, although, you know, they would probably take in some uh, folks that maybe had some disabilities to do some uh, help, you know, and so forth in the warehouse. But, but generally speaking, I think it was primarily focused on, you know, helping feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so you're involved with Rotary I am. as well? And, and you're still involved with Rotary? I am. Okay. Tell us about that. Well, I've been a Rotarian for on and off for probably 25 years, and you know, I just really like the organization. And so, you know, if you look at kind of the mission, you know, it, it basically, you know, every meeting we go to, it's basically the four-way test of Rotary. It says, you know, is what we're doing, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Does what Rotary does, does it bring goodwill and better friendships? And more importantly, is it beneficial to all concerned? And so uh, the group, you know, really is focused on those four.
core principles in, you know, I guess first and foremost, it's a an organization that provides good fellowship and good interaction each week, but it really is an organization that at its core has done some tremendous work over the years. It's a national organization. I happen to belong to the downtown Des Moines Rotary Club, and so today they're really focused on, you know, doing some educational and charitable activities, whether it's uh, doing awards for the police and firefighters, college scholarships. Uh, there's a program where they uh, read to lead, you know, in some of the elementary schools. They do some campership things for youngsters. Thanksgiving, they do food baskets and do some work for Salvation Army. But I think the most impressive thing for me with Rotary is they really took the lead years ago when polio was a significant concern in this country and really led the effort to eradicate polio in, you know, almost all of the world. And still today is working on you know, making that 100% reality. So today I think there's still three countries, Nigeria, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, that still, you know, have uh, polio as an endemic disease that you know, is still being worked on. But, you know, I think the most remarkable achievement that I could say that Rotary's ever done has been its efforts that it put forward to help, you know, uh, vaccinate people against polio. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, so is prevent preventing disease still a high priority? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So since uh, today's disease is mainly of a preventable nature because we're in the age of modern medicine, would they be up for uh, preventive health care initiatives? Yeah. Again, I don't know that there's anything on the front burner today. Um, you know, I think there's been some mission support and trying to help people. For instance, the Rotary Club you know, that I was in in Waterloo for years. There was mission trips that went to Nicaragua, you know, to help people that were underserved there. And, you know, we'd ship items down there that they, they needed. So, you know, probably, and again, this will vary from Rotary Club to Rotary Club. Everybody's got a little different initiative that they work on. Um, you know, the one in Waterloo that I was part of, it was really focused on doing some humanitarian things. Uh, here in this Rotary Club, it's focused on other things, but all pretty much things that are really being put forth every day to improve the quality of the community, the sustainability of the community. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other uh, things that they focus on in terms of community sustainability? Well, again, kind of the list that I went through is primarily the projects that they work on. And so I think really trying to, um, you know, be a leader in the community. And, you know, there's a uh, exchange program that they promote. And so there's... Uh, students that come from other parts of the country on an exchange basis and there's kids from here that go to other countries and so um, you know really to watch some people that come from other countries and experience what happens here and the culture is something that rotary's been a big supporter of as well mm -hmm. yeah great how has the the mission changed over the years uh you know so so we've got um you know polio as a top priority um when that was mm -hmm. an issue, do, do you know? Uh, and I don't mean to be putting you on the spot here, but do you know uh, what some of the top priorities became after after that? Well, again, I think it probably, at least from my perspective, became a little more individualized to, to each club, and so each club's probably living out the core mission of Rotary, you know, which is to you know do good work and be a good service club that's participating in the community. Um, I would say a lot of them have probably taken on a little bit more of that humanitarian flavor where, you know, they've uh, done some trips abroad where there's been a need and tried to do different things that can make a difference. Okay. Yeah, so so the uh, – actually, that's interesting. So the, the specific goals are up to the individual clubs, mm -hmm. and the, the larger organization does not uh, necessarily – Mandate that you're going to do this particular activity, right? But but was the but but they have um, specific goals for um, the the national part of the organization uh, apart from the specific yeah so clubs. there's 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 a national rotary organization a worldwide ro uh, rotary organization it's just mm -hmm. not nationally it's worldwide yeah and so they uh, there's a platform and um, you know a set of initiatives and generally. You know, that gets communicated down through the clubs and yeah that's how that works good deal 
Uh, I I knew uh, someone that worked at the headquarters in in Evanston. Oh, okay. So um, it'd be interesting to to see what their interest would be in in something like like preventive healthcare. Mm-hmm. So, um, so every major uh, city has you know a network of food banks, uh, goodwill donation centers like the Salvation Army. Um, those can be expanded. Um, with the skills and, and resources that, that we have in this in this country, and uh, partnerships are a way to, to do that. You've you've mentioned some of those partnerships, but um, you know since you've been part of so many different kinds of organizations, what kind of partnerships do you think work best for building communities? Well, again, I think that um, you know the partnership works best when there's a a group of people uh, or a community that can rally behind a, a common cause or common effort. So, I mean, the partnership can take the form of just an individual uh, doing some volunteer work or a nonprofit organization. It can take the form of a company really stepping up and making a financial impact and a large volunteer support commitment to a particular cause. And so, you know, what I have found is that if there's a good cause and there's a real need and more importantly if something being done can produce a significant change in results people will get behind it mm-hmm. and um, I think what you'll find is the whatever the competitive nature might be I happen to be in the banking industry but all banks support United Way you know all of us support economic development we do that for a reason because it helps us live out our our stated mission and objective, which is to, you know, make a difference in our community. So when you think about partnerships, it really can take a lot of different forms. Sometimes it takes a a, uh, more of a public commitment through some of your governmental agencies. Again, funding is so important for a lot of these things to move forward. And so then the question is, where does that come from? Because, um, Without that many times, it it really has a hard time moving to first base. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what are the uh, criteria that give a cause credibility? Well, again, I think if there's a, a need and a, a cost, probably not just a need, but sometimes if you're looking at it from a community perspective and there's a cost, um, there's a cost with, which is the flip side of all the things perhaps that we've talked about today. You know, what's the cost of not doing the right things to have high quality education? What's the cost of not doing everything we can with preventative health care? What's the cost of not, you know, trying to be as competitive as we can, trying to bring more businesses here and provide better jobs? Um, and unless it, you look at both sides and understand the cost benefit, um, it's really hard to wrap your mind around a lot of these initiatives. And I think that's sometimes where things stall. So, you know, there's a lot of good causes, but I think, you know, you have to do kind of an impact assessment. You know, what's the cost if we do nothing? What's the cost if we do something? Uh, what, what's the cost if we do something in between? Yeah. Sometimes uh, the cost and benefit uh, don't justify, you know, moving the initiative forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I think it's easy for all of us to recognize there's just a, hundreds of tremendous organizations and efforts taking place every day and so every day you know as an individual donor or volunteer you're being forced to make a decision or being asked to make a decision not forced of which ones are you going to prioritize and support yeah well you know sustainability fits into that category because the numbers are are really clear Mm -hmm. you know when when we're when we're talking about you know preventive health care you know 70% 70% preventable disease, if you're talking about vocational sustainability, workplace sustainability, you know, 71% disengaged workers, uh, according to uh, to Gallup. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, those are attractive numbers for any employer. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because they, uh, the, the numbers justification is, is there. Uh, for those things. And, and yet, when it comes to implementation, that's, you know, that's uh, a harder step. Uh, because, because 
uh, for instance, with workplace wellness, uh, you know, at least half of the employers out there have initiated, including small business, uh, have, have initiated workplace wellness, but only about 7% are doing it right. So, so you can, you can see the, um, you know, the cost benefit and take action on that. And yet, uh, figuring out what the right action to take is, is, is not always that easy to do. Have you, have you found that to be the case or? Well, again, I mean, it's really hard to get your mind wrapped around a lot of this, particularly if you're not living it every day. So many times when you think your way through this, I mean, you really have to put a lot of faith in, you know, who's running that organization, who's the executive director, uh, who's on the board of directors that's helping, you know, guide this organization. And, you know, uh, do you have confidence in them that, you know, they're doing a good job and will see whatever it is through to the end yeah so um you know again it's really about trying to partner and work with organizations that maybe have a track record of of getting it done and, and demonstrating proven results yeah yeah so is that how you pick a, a strong team for the for the board or what what are the what are the uh crucial elements of um um, making a successful organization. Does, w- what's the order? Does uh, you know picking the board come first? Uh, what? How does all that work? Well, again, you have to have a high quality executive director that's passionate about the organization that they're running, and they have to be a good leader, good communicator, and and somebody that can really arc- articulate the the mission of the organization. When it comes to the board, um, I think having a good cross section of people that represent a lot of different. Uh, interest and companies and you know a good cross section of the community is always good you know I think having a rotating board is always good so that you're always bringing fresh perspective onto the board is critical and then you know within that board having good committee structures that are focused on different specific initiatives that need that kind of attention yeah is also key but again it's an organization that's thought about its mission statement, they have a good strategic plan, and a history of being able to execute. Yeah, yeah. I just read an article on uh, the the benefits of diversity mm-hmm. in team building, and they're saying, you know, mentioning some of the research where uh, if someone is is um, if you're meeting with someone uh, on a project, and that person, the more different that person is from you, uh, the better you are prepared. Uh, and and if you're meeting with someone that is that is very similar to you, uh, you're not as prepared, uh, for, you know, for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, that team diversity aspect is uh, a real working principle. Well, I would tell you this, Ted. I've learned so much from people that have a different opinion than me, and um, you know, it, it really has. I may end up with the same opinion that it started with, but it certainly caused me to challenge my own point of view and think about it. And so I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, we're with John Roshan uh, today on Jet Radio, and he is talking with us about community uh, investments and his experience with uh, uh, 30 different organizations over the years. And so when we come back, uh, we'll continue our discussion about community investment. Thanks for joining us today. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live.
Credit cards are like grandkids. They love you, sometimes get out of control, and it's fun to get a new one. Who can stop them from piling on? Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of Des Moines. At the end of the day, you can return the grandkids, but you're stuck paying off bad credit card debt. We'll help you put the fun back into using credit cards responsibly. Right, kids? Yeah! If you need help getting credit cards off your back, call Consumer Credit of Des Moines. Hi, welcome back to JIT Radio. I'm Ted Char, your host, and with me today is John Rothschild. He is the regional president of Bank Iowa, and we're here talking today about community investment. And uh, before the break, we were talking a bit about um, uh, the criteria for causes that, that people get behind, and, and community investment is one of those things. Sustainability is one of those things. Uh, many other causes meet that uh, criteria. So, uh, John, you're, uh, you've been involved with banking for a long time. 35 years. Yeah. What, um, what is the bank's role in the community? Well, if you look at any banking organization, I think if you look at the mission statement, it says that we really would like to be a strong corporate citizen, you know, a leading business in our community, and really should be looked to you know, for leadership and guidance in many of the things that we're talking about today. Uh, in fact, when you look at all banks, we're in a highly regulated industry, and we're all held accountable to doing just what I've talked about, uh, being active and involved in our community. There's a thing in banking regulation called CRA. It's a Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and so every several years, we're examined to basically uh, give us a report card on are we doing just that? Are we, you know, making the right investments into, you know, the things that we're talking about? Are we lending responsibly and, you know, lending to the low and moderate income uh, sector uh, of the communities that we serve? Are we, you know, trying to do everything we can to make uh, home loans and home ownership a possibility? And, you know, are we doing things to help improve the financial awareness and financial literacy of our customers? Um, all banks generally belong to our group organization, the Iowa Bankers Association, and, and our association helps package and promotes some of those very things. So they have a financial literacy program and some other things that really uh, help us fulfill our mission, you know, in trying to do that day in and day out. Mm -hmm. So is one of the bank when when someone wants to uh, invest in the community, start a project, and they go to the bank for a loan, uh, th does the bank try and uh, help um, uh, steer the ship in terms of making that a sustainable uh, project? Well, I think you know at least in our case, and everybody would be a little bit different. I mean, I would look, really look at every interaction and every loan application as an opportunity to. To, to do that particular deal. Now, in reality, there's a lot of considerations that come into it, and, and you know, we analyze risk and credit and character and capacity to repay and all those kinds of things. But I think we really look at every opportunity, you know, how can we get it done? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to get it done. Uh, many times we might rely on a business loan, for instance, that's a startup. Uh, to go out and get an SBA guarantee, Small Business Administration guarantee. We might work with the USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, to get a guarantee, um, or, you know, other types of structures. And, uh, you know, there's other uh, ways to maybe put a deal together that are different than the way it's initially presented. So you really want a bank that's working hard on your behalf to figure out how can we get it done, or if it can't be done at that particular time, to at least p spend the time and counsel you on what are the things that you need to, to do so that the next time we look at this, it's better prepared so that it can be approved at that time. No, that's great. So, so what is um, a guarantee from the SBA? Well, basically what that would say is that, okay, there's maybe a little more risk in that loan than normal. And for the bank to get comfortable to make it, you know, we'd like a little more protection in the event of default that it's going to get repaid. So depending on the size of the loan, uh, the SBA will provide the bank a loan guarantee uh, up to 90% of that loan amount that says if that loan would 
going to default, could not be repaid for whatever reason, your loss potential in that loan would be uh, limited to 10%. percent mm -hmm. So that would be just to the bank? To the bank. Okay. Gotcha. And does that sort of thing uh, help um, improve the chances of, of projects uh, getting going and succeeding? And It does. And the SBA many times can provide some expanded terms. Um, and, you know, it, it alters the way that we evaluate the risk profile of what we can put on the bank's balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, can banks invest in uh, do a lot to invest in education? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think again, it gets back to our charitable dollars, and again, whether it's a financial commitment, you know, to fund. One of the things that uh, you know I've really been high on is an organization called Junior Achievement. And so that's where a lot of banks uh, have worked with schools to get into the classrooms to teach uh, a junior achievement curriculum that really touches on so many areas of, you know, of a person's fa finances and, you know, if they owned a business and how that would look and what that would be like. And so um, they do some really good programming. Um, certainly, you know, mentoring students is always a rewarding experience, I think, for both sides, because if you can get in front of uh, some young people and not just talk about banking, but anything that can make a difference in their life, that's important as well. Mm -hmm. How much um, How much, and how, how does the bank structure uh, its, its funding, uh, charitable uh, funding? Uh, you know, when it just, not necessarily a loan, but when it, when it gives uh, money. To, uh, Again, everybody uh, would do this differently. If I were to look at our bank, I would say that you know we're probably, you know, looking at probably a third for economic development efforts, a, a third for, you know, education, and a third for, kind of nonprofits and chambers. And and will it be exactly that at the end of the year? Absolutely not. But we don't probably want to do every dollar in just one particular category. We would like to touch more organizations if possible mm -hmm. so you you pick uh, general categories and then you pick a, a few specific organizations within those categories correct and then you change that year to year based on your uh, priorities for that year yeah I mean there's again many of them that you routinely give to year after year but there are different ones that uh, you know provide some diversity I guess and mm -hmm. where you put your funds year over year yeah so so if you have a uh, uh, an organization that's receiving funds, that's uh, that's doing great year after year. Do you uh, do you just keep going with it? Not or? necessarily. Again, you know, it's not uncommon for us to add a little more to a cause here and, and maybe you know uh, minimize maybe something that we've done the year before. I mean, hopefully we're in a situation where that's not the case, and you know when we grow our bank and grow our profitability we are committed to giving a certain percentage of our net income so hopefully it's not where we're taking away from somebody else it's that we've we've done better so we've got more to give mm -hmm. yeah who would you like to give more to well there's so many great organizations um i mean again beyond the ones that we've mentioned i mean you look at uh, jdrf you look at uh, variety club you, you just look at make a wish i mean you just look at so many organizations that um, are doing tremendous work and so I'm sure there's others that we would like to add to the list that we've historically supported but mm. in some ways I'd like to do more for the ones that we already do support yeah tell us about the juvenile diabetes foundation well again it's a remarkable organization that uh, is putting a lot of effort forward to help particularly youth deal with and manage diabetes and um, you know, I think we're making progress on that front, and um, a lot of good work is being done, but it does seem like diabetes, at least in our society at all ages, is a, a growing concern, and, um, you know, it's going to take as much focus as, it, as we can put behind it, because going back to that cost-benefit discussion that we had earlier, uh, diabetes is a very costly disease. Um, 
and you know, the sooner that we can, you know, put a cure behind it and manage it better, um, the better off I think we'll all be. Yeah. Now, having said that, that's, that's it's easier said than done. Yeah. And, um, no, it, it is. It's in fact that's a, uh, that's a perfect segue because it get it touches on a couple of important issues, and one is it easier said than done, as you said, because uh, we have a lot of socially acceptable uh, addiction in, in a prosperous nation, and and food addiction is is one of those. Uh, most people don't don't realize it. Uh, porn addiction is one of those, and and so we're we're a nation of of preventable disease in, in many ways where, where we can really yield a ton of, of cost savings just by addressing the obvious. But addressing the obvious is not always easy because it, it deals with, with behavior change and, and behavior change doesn't come about unless uh, there's a, d- a desire to do so. But, um, you know, that's, that's, I think, where one of the, where one of the most valuable aspects of community investment can be you know, for a country like ours, uh, is investment in uh, recovery type programs, and uh, you know, I, I, I think um, as as people get more used to the idea uh, that that there is a widespread problem, you know, whether whether it's food or porn or, or whatever it is, that maybe some of those social stigmas will, will start to come down. But but what? Um, what, what do you think can be done to to do more community investment in, in recovery type programs? Well, again, I think when you use diabetes again for as an example or or other concerns, I think we do really really need to understand that, like I said earlier, it's it's not as easy as one thinks to get out in front of this. Um, you know, I think again. Uh, helping people that are dealing with these issues and concerns, being compassionate about it, um, letting folks know that they're not alone. I mean, and there's a lot of folks that are suffering and struggling on a lot of different fronts, and I think so so many times they feel alone and confined, and, um, you know, and it, it probably gets in the way of perhaps moving forward, and so... I think we all own these problems. You know, we all own a commitment to provide a solution. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a big question. Yeah. It's a big topic. And yeah. And um, there's no one answer. Yeah. And, well, I mean, but you hit on a pertinent issue, which is uh, letting people know that they're not alone is, is one of the biggest initial mm-hmm. barriers. And actually, that's what recovery programs are, are all about. So... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to, to open up the door to, to more staffing or, or uh, opening of, of recovery programs, uh, you know, like Celebrate Recovery, uh, that, that could really yield a lot of benefits, you know, for uh, redeeming some of those, some of those recovery um, numbers uh, that, are, that are costing us in, in preventative health care. So, um, you know, another thing... Uh, that that could be a worthwhile investment is uh, mentoring uh, mm-hmm. programs. Um, have you had experience with with different mentoring programs? Oh sure. I mean, we uh, I've been involved in outside mentoring opportunities, um, but you know, quite honestly, there's plenty of mentoring to do sometimes even within our own company. And so, when it comes to uh, mentoring young employees that are coming on board with our bank or, you know, stepping across and working with others in some other setting that resembles mentoring, training, whatever it might be, I think all of those opportunities are really good. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you know, and, and I think the reason why uh, mentoring programs are so important is because it's that long-term life-on-life uh, relationship that, that helps people change. You know, nobody changes after one webinar you know right. or uh or, or one sit down discussion it's it's you know we have to hear things over and over and uh preferably with a with a from a variety of of sources yeah. and that's that's what gets uh yeah. i would important. say that, um 
the folks that mentor, God bless you. I mean, because it's in, it really is hard work, uh, particularly if that takes you out of your comfort zone to do it. Um, but I think it makes such a difference for both parties involved in that mentoring process. Um, so I, I say hats off to folks that do just a lot of that, particularly with our youth, far more than, than I do. Um, I just say thank you because it's really important, and I think it makes a big difference in people's lives. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think it probably makes the, the biggest difference. Mm -hmm. But it's just, you know, we, we have more uh, nonprofits than any other country, and, uh, and, and yet, you know, there can never be <clears throat> enough organizations to, to cover the need. Mm -hmm. But there are enough uh, families that would be capable of mentoring other families or peers mm -hmm. that would be capable of mentoring other peers. You know, there's, uh, there's enough, um, you know, kind of free family to family help to go around. But, but there's, I, I don't think there'll ever be enough uh, paid agency right. dollars to go around. What do you think? Oh, I think you're probably right. Yeah. And again, I think, you know, what we're really talking about here is relationships. You and I spoke about that. I think the the more that each of us can work on our relationships, uh, whether it's through a mentoring process or some other means, um, th that will make a big difference in allowing us to move forward with a lot of these topics as well. Yeah. How how do you uh, how do you recommend working on uh, relationships? Well, again, I think it's it's taking time out of our busy schedules to not get in our own way and you know, really opening our eyes and ears to what's going on around us. And for me, it's slowing down and, and paying attention. Um, I think we all have to understand it's not about me, it's not about us, and, and make sure that we're, you know, spending the right amount of time with others. Yeah. And, and it's just important. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. That's a great summary. I... Um... You know, if if uh, it sounds like you place a high priority on uh, on relationships, I do in in your life and and in business. Mm -hmm. And uh, do do you try to uh, uh, interact? Uh, try to get those different circles to interact with each other. Well, yes, I mean, again, you know, I try to do that um, probably in all aspects of my life, but you know, my day to day life as a banker. You know, I'm always trying to bring people together, uh, trying to spend the right amount of time with people. Um, again, I'm probably somebody that likes to talk and, and you know, likes to lead, but I've learned sometimes that the skill that I need to work on the most is to listen. And so I think um, the more we just pay attention and open our eyes and our ears to what's going on around us, um, and then allow that somewhat to drive our conversations and our relationships. Uh, it's not easy to do. It's not easy for me to do, but um, and everybody does it differently. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, so I think that's probably a good point to to end on. You know, by we're, we're talking about some of the types of relationships in the community that that we could prioritize, mm -hmm. and and I think by doing that, um, it does get to the base level of. Uh, building a sustainable community, and uh, if if we do that, you know maybe there there is uh, still a way and and time to you know turn things around with our national finances. But you know it's it's kind of getting to the point where we have to invest while we still can. You know, yeah. and uh, and I would say as we you know kind of wrap up here, I mean everybody has something to offer. Um, you know, and some folks it might be. You know, their financial resources, others, it's their time, others, it's, it's their expertise, it's their volunteer time. But, you know, I think everyone's contribution and effort in tackling a particular initiative as it pertains to sustainability is, is important. So, yeah. No, everyone does have something to offer. Mm -hmm. So thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. And thanks for being with us on Jet Radio. Again, our guest has been John Rothschild. He is the regional president of Bank Iowa, and we've been talking today about community sustainability and community investment. Thanks for joining us.